Okay. There's a reason I turned the lights off and uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's just so I could see, uh, see the color of the steel as it was uh, heating up. You want it to come up to critical temp and then uh, as you let it cool briefly, you'll see like a, like a ghostly shadow pass through the, uh, through the red and the orange. And uh, once that passes through, you quench it straight away now. What I did is called differential quenching. I only quenched the actual blade section. Um, uh, first in the oil to, to cool it and then into the water. So, and now we are... Okay, so first rubbing, and as you can probably see in there, I stick my blades in through the rack, so the actual blade itself, the cutting edge, is not sitting on the rack. Reason I do that is for heat transference. So if uh, if you heat this thing up and that grill's sitting against your cutting edge, especially the finer parts of that edge. Um, you're going to have a slight temperature variation and I've actually had knives where I've pulled it out of the oven and you can see the grill marks on the on the steel and that can't be a good thing so I do that keeps it off the grill not a problem at all so that's going to sit in there for a good hour and uh, I've got it set now at 250 so I'll back that off just a touch and I'll uh, do a solid hour and then I'll let it cool down while that's happening, uh, let's work on the uh, stencil for the etch and I'll explain exactly how I do that. Okay, so many of you probably have seen this thing called a cricket. Um, I know that on one of Adam's tested videos, he actually had a, a, uh, a lady cut up uh, some resists for him uh, using a cricket. So very easy. Open. This is one of the simplest plotters I've ever seen in my life. Uh, I did have at one stage a industrial sized uh, plotter, and it was a nightmare to use by comparison to this. Um, the pads that you stick your uh, your vinyl onto. Uh, uh, slightly tacky, they come in different uh, sizes, uh, different tack, um, sort of percentage, like the, these, I like the green ones, they are, uh, they are sticky, but not overly, just enough to hold the vinyl down. Um, they do get dirty over time, so they are kind of what I consider a consumable. Um, I also cut them down if uh, part of it gets too dirty or whatever. You don't have to throw the whole thing out. You're mainly cutting something small, so a little piece like this is perfect. Um, Okay, so I'm just going to take a small amount of vinyl. Don't need that. Just lay it straight across the top. Try and get it to stick down as best as we, as best as we can. Just losing its tack across the top, so maybe we'll put it down a little lower. And. That should do just nicely. It's not overly complex what we're cutting, so as long as it holds on long enough to do that. 
Okay, so. Okay, so once you've turned everything on and you've stuck your vinyl down, insert it underneath these two little guides here, push it in until it stops. Over here I have an arrow and it automatically feeds to where it needs to start and it lights up and you're all good. Once that's done, Okay, so we're going to go for, okay, so we go for a new project, over here we go to upload, upload image, browse, Now on my desktop, we will find Savage JPEG. We go to Simple, because we're just cutting, continue. Uh, now what we need to do is work out what we're going to keep and what we're going to erase. So if we select the Magic Eraser and click, it will remove the background. And due to the fact that there's no solid A or anything or an O, we don't have to go in and clean out anything else. It's actually one hit wonder. It's awesome. Okay. Now I chose this font because I often see Adam wearing a t-shirt with uh, his name in the NASA font. So I replicated that and then we hit continue. Now save as a cut image. Save. And then we just have to select this guy. Hit insert images. Okay. And as you see on here, the grid reference here, it is matches the one on the, uh, the backing pad, the green thing. So for every inch on here, it matches up with the inch on there, which makes things very, very easy to work out. So we take the knife and we look at the size of this and we lay it down against that line and it takes up approximately half the width so going back to here we then grab this little guy and then we reduce the size until it is a little bit under half the width and then once that's done, we just have to go and hit make it. It will then bring up this screen, grab hold of it and move it to its location. Now, because I laid my bit of vinyl lower than what would normally be the top of this cutting mat, I have to move down to say three inches. So I've moved it down to three inches, move it in just from the edge a little, hit uh, continue. It will uh, go through making sure that the cricket is uh, attached and everything else and everything's ready to go. And, uh, this is a, a new update 
I haven't actually seen this before so just bear with me for a minute sorry about that uh vellum construction paper on vinyl all right well that's different okay now when it's ready to go the the cricket logo over here will start flashing just hit that and it will start Cricket is a very cool little machine. Uh, you see A and B here, um, B is the uh, the cutter. You can get different size cutters, different blade types. You can cut everything from thin paper all the way through to thick leather. Uh, very much worth the investment. Uh, and they aren't very expensive. I think I paid about 300 Australian dollars for this, brand new. Uh, the A section uh, is for a plotting pen. You can draw as well as cut. Now, if you look down here, I don't know how well you'll see that. Let's just press that, spit this out. You can make out the Savage logo. Let's see that. So what we are going to be doing, though, is I want the lettering to be the etch. Uh, a lot of the time, I actually like the look of having the background etched out uh, so the lettering is raised. Um... I may do that on the other one, but for now, I'm just gonna remove the lettering and I'm gonna weed them out. Okay, so these have been through heat treat and uh, tempering and everything else. And uh, you can actually tell by uh, the color gradient through the steel that uh, I only worked on the uh, cutting edge. So <clears throat> we already roughed in uh, the bevels. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to use uh, the, exactly the same kind of ceramic belt. This is uh, a preferred uh, VSM, but this is a 120. We used the 36 grid earlier. Uh, I'm just going to clean up these bevels a little bit with this, and then uh, we're going to swap over to uh, a different kind of abrasive belt, and then we'll clean up the uh, the rest of the Kiridashi, and, um, and then the fun stuff begins. So let's clean these up.
Uh, one thing I didn't mention earlier is uh, one of these wooden handle magnet. Uh, I've had this for a lot of years and uh, fantastic magnet, super strong magnet. Uh, really helps holding on to smaller stuff like this and, and things that are kind of awkward. Even larger knives when you're doing your bevel, uh, very easy just to clamp it on like that. Keeps your fingers away from the belt, but also keeps your fingers away from the heat, especially when uh, it's a small amount of steel. It's uh, incredibly uh, fast uh, at uh, transferring heat. So one minute this thing's freezing cold after coming out of the water and uh, within, you know, 10 seconds this thing's so hot that it's burning the skin off your fingers. So magnet, great idea, okay? Um, all right, so both of these bevels are done and uh, now it's just a case of, most people would just start going through the grits of the belts now. Uh, increasing them until you get rid of the grind lines. Um, I don't go through every grit. Uh, I find it time consuming and unnecessary. Uh, if I was going by hand, uh, yes, I would go through grit by grit, uh, but with something that chews off uh, material as quickly as this thing, you can afford to skip a few belts in between. Uh, plus there's also no point wearing out you know, more materials uh, and, and supplies than, than you actually need to. So this is a, a 120 and I'm going to jump straight up to somewhere around a, a 220. Um, and um, again, can continue from there. So if you give me one second, swap this out. Okay, so this is a uh, a different a different belt, a different type of belt, I should say. Uh, it's a uh, preferred VSM, uh, what they call a compact grain belt. Uh, this is a 240 grit. Uh, it's a, it's a very soft, very flexible. Uh, they work very very well if you use rounded contact wheels. Um, the uh, you know half inch, one inch wide uh, dome shaped contact wheel, um, very good for um, for fullers and things of that nature. Um, because uh, unlike the ceramic belts I was using earlier, the uh, the backing of this belt is very flexible, very soft. Um, but it's in saying that it's also very very strong. So. Um, uh, I'm just going to use this uh, to continue the uh, the bevels and um, yeah, we'll just keep going.
Okay, so we are going up for a large jump now. We are going to go all the way up to 600. One thing, uh, I know some belts, uh, the heavier grits, like the 36 grit uh, Norton belts, I know they were not unidirectional. Um, from what I've seen of the uh, preferred VSM belts that I've been using, they are directional. So you make sure you put them on the right direction and look at the arrow. Uh, it is It is important. Okay, so what I'm doing here is just weeding out the uh, areas that I want to etch. In this case, it's the, uh, the font. If I wanted the font to be raised on the object that I'm etching, I would be weeding out the background as opposed to the lettering. Uh, I will cover that in another video uh, where it'll go into a bit more comprehensive on uh, on the etching process and I'll show you how to uh, do a negative etch uh, without a border around it so you're actually fading out from a, an etch to the original surface without having any uh, visible line uh, so we just quickly remove these and uh, thanks Adam for having uh, such a easy name. Certainly making my life a lot easier. Okay. Now this is a uh, transfer film. It's just a, uh, a clear, low-tack adhesive film. And uh, what I do is lay that over the top of our stencil. I often use the round handle of the scissors to burnish the vinyl. to do is then try and pick up the corner very carefully lift it from the surface so this is uh, the adhesive side we're done with that so now all I need to do is separate these two there for now now with the blades what I've done is uh, I use that same 600 belt I gave it a very very light touch just to remove any of the debris that was on uh, on the surface of the blade So I very lightly uh, cleaned the surface just with the 600 belt uh, very, very quickly, just a, a couple of seconds. Um, obviously you can see it's not a, a great cleaning job. All I wanted to do was get rid of some of this scale and stuff that was left behind from the heat treat. Um, now you can use acetone. I'm using uh, what is called white spirit. Uh, it's, it's a cleaning fluid works very 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 well it's, uh, i guess it's kind of a degreaser in a way it uh chews its way through almost anything um to leave a, a good clean surface for uh for vinyl paint or pretty much anything you can uh, you can think of Now, 
I'm a little concerned about these two marks. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get some uh, 1200 grit sand, a wet and dry sandpaper. And I'm just going to sand it off. A bit of white spirit. Great. Now, the uh, transfer film is very good if you line up these grid references. Now, they help you position things just where you would like them and make sure everything stays nice and straight. Because it goes right up towards the edge. Let's trim that down a little. Now, normally your uh, your resist or stencil, whatever you want to call it, is often um, far more complicated than than this name. So, removing the uh, the transfer film can sometimes be a real nightmare. So the best thing to do is to sort of hold it down and roll it back on itself. If you actually lift and pull, it will uh, it will pull the whole thing off. See that A is just starting to lift a little. Same with the V. Shit.
Okay guys, I'm back again. So, we're ready to etch. Now, one thing I've learned over the years is when you're doing something like etching, mask up your work and mask it up well. For the few extra minutes that it takes to go that little extra mile to, to make sure that every bit of your work is covered, Believe me, it'll save you a whole lot of heartache. Um, I couldn't tell you how many times over the years I've, you know, not realized that there was a small gap and burned a hole into something beautiful or, you know, just things that are so easy to prevent. Just take the time, take the time. Okay, that's, that's all I could say. So etching, very easy. And if you don't know how to do this, you're probably going to kick yourself because it's so damn simple. Um, this is some, I don't know, some super expensive rare pink salt. I don't know. But at the end of the day, it's salt. The same stuff you put on your food. This, cleaning vinegar. You can use normal white vinegar. Uh, it doesn't really matter. You don't even need to use vinegar. You can just use water with the salt. Just salt water. Okay, it's that basic. Um... So what we're going to do is we are going to mix up a small amount of vinegar with the salt. Not too much, just, just a little bit. Excuse all the uh, rattling and the noise in the background. It's gotten very windy here for some strange reason. We've had a beautiful day today and uh, the weather's taken a turn for the worse so unfortunately my workshop door is uh, aluminium and it rattles quite a lot so please uh, forgive the uh, the racket okay um, now as for the electrical side of things car battery charger not all of them will work you want believe it or not a cheap one the cheaper ones for out of China and stuff like that generally don't come with uh, yeah, safety cutoffs and you know l earth leakage shorting, cutting out, all that kind of safety stuff. Um, if you have a charger with all that stuff, it probably won't work because it will detect the 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 short because essentially that's what we're doing. We're shorting it out. Uh, and it will cut off. Okay, so this one, uh, I don't remember, I think I got it on eBay. Uh, it was cheap, it was about 20 bucks. I have etched more stuff than I can, be, <laughs> way, way more stuff than I care to remember. Um, and I've never had a problem with it, and it's never cut out on me yet. Uh, be, bear in mind, doing this, the surface of the thing that you're etching is gonna get warm, not too hot. Uh, but the electrode that you use to make contact with the surface gets very, very hot, okay? It takes a while to get there, but it does get there. So just bear in mind that, that it will be warm. So it's this simple. On the negative, and always the negative, uh, I've just put a bulldog clip, uh, wrapped the wire around it, and that holds just cotton, okay? Just a standard old cotton ball. The uh, reason I do this is because it covers a lot more area and you can, I mean, this is perfect because it's the same width as the, the logo that we're etching. And the positive that you're attached to your work, I put another bulldog clip on it. Uh, so all we need to do is expose a small part on the back end, like so. And we just clamp it on like so. This has a magnet, which is excellent because it holds things in place okay like that and that's it we are ready to go so all we have to do is soak the cotton in the saline solution and then once I touch it to the surface you'll immediately hear like a sizzle uh, and that's exactly what's happening it's creating a circuit and that electricity is um, is heating up and accelerating the uh, the salt solution, which eating away at the carbon steel. Uh, it does work on aluminium and brass, bronze, copper, 
uh, stainless steel, uh, pretty much every kind of metal that I've tried this on, it has worked. Some metals work better than others. Um, obviously, carved steel and mild steels give you a far better result than stainless does. Uh, but all in all, I haven't found anything that uh, resists what I want to do. So, and of course I picked a, uh, a blast that's not quite big enough. Okay. And then all we do is... Now, you can already see that it's instantly changed colour because it, the, the reaction has started and, and it's going to start chewing away at the, uh, at the surface. Now, I'm going to do a fairly deep edge. If, if your electrode doesn't cover the entire surface of what you're trying to etch, it's super important that you time how long you hold in position. So if I was doing this in three parts or two parts, I, I would need to count 30 seconds, then move 30 seconds, and then back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But also it's important that you change the overlap so you don't keep going in the same spot, otherwise you will get a, a division that you can see. And we don't want that. Okay, so let's, uh, let's get going. Now, there's no way you're going to hear this, but uh, I'm just going to change the location of the camera. You probably still won't hear it even though the camera's so close. But we'll see. And if you look closely, you may be able to see it, but if you look closely at the, uh, the cotton where it meets the bulldog clip, you'll see all this very fine bubbling where the electrolysis is uh, starting. You can, uh, oh, well, clearly you can see it now. It's, it's starting to warm up now and the reaction's getting far more violent. And that is exactly what we want. We really want it to go nuts. The more aggressive this uh, this reaction, the uh, the more material that it will dissolve. Sorry about the noise, guys. So, in in its basic terms, what we're doing here is forcing corrosion. Just basically, we are rusting out a certain pattern. That's all. It's uh, it's nothing complex it's nothing overly complicated the you know it is very very simple straightforward and easy to do and it, it it really astounds me that there isn't more knife makers out there doing what i do with this you know so many of us use this exact method to to put their logo or touch mark on their blade but they have their stencils made professionally and then they only use it to do this tiny little logo and uh, but there's no reason why you can't take it that one step further make your own stencil you know i just showed you how easy that is and there is no limit to the size of of what you can you can etch like this um, you know, I've etched a, a five foot long sword, the entire blade in filigree, and yes, it took time. Obviously, looking at how long this is taking, 
um, that will give you a pretty good indication of how long it took me to do the sword blade. But it's just so much safer and so much cleaner and personally I think you get a far better result than you ever will using ferric chloride or some sort of chemical etch. Now, I need to etch this quite deeply because I still need to flatten out and polish the surface of both of these kiridashi. Um, so if I etch too shallow and I put it on the belt grinder and I end up taking too much off the surface, then I run the risk of losing part of my edge. And if that happens, well, then we're in, uh, we're in some trouble. Okay, we're getting towards the end now. So right here I have ferric chloride solution. Um, it's a very strong solution. Now you may notice after I throw these blades in and pull them out, they may look uh, kind of like a rose gold color. The reason for that is inside this ferric chloride, I actually have a substantial amount of copper that I dissolved into it. And the copper will bind to the carbon steel. Um, not quite sure why it does that and not binding to the nickel, but it's what it does. So anyway, I've just cleaned these down with some acetone. Um, we're gonna, gonna sit them in there and give them a little bit of a bath and let's see how they come up. Now, even though I've cleaned them and I've rubbed them down and I dried them off with clean rags, towels and everything else, it's always a good idea once it's in the ferric to actually use the ferric chloride to just give it a once over and uh, try and uh, get rid of anything that might be residual on the surface of the steel. Oh, here we go. Starting. It's starting already. This is going to be awesome. Oh, damn, look at that. Yeah. So, I don't know about you guys, but I'm kind of torn. I, I used to think Damascus was the absolute dust guts, you know, the, the best kind of steel pattern thing in the world, you know, and, but as the years have sort of gone on, I, I've, I think I've become more partial to San Mai than I am with Damascus. Um, like in this case, it's actually a San Mai blade, but I cladded the outside with some Damascus that I forged. So it's, yeah, I don't know. There's something about San Mai. I mean, even if it's just basic, really, you know, brass tacks, basic sand mine, get high carbon core and you know and, and even a mild steel jacket it doesn't need to be anything high nickel or anything like that it can just be mild steel there's just something about that edge like how it looks like a hamon but it's not a hamon uh, yeah and it's so, it's so easy to manipulate to what you want i mean you can make that that line look like a heartbeat you know, if you wanted to. Um, there's just so many different things you can do. Um, I mean, I know Damascus is the same, and I, I love canister Damascus, and I love doing um, um, mosaic Damascus. Uh, but um, just the, the, the general sort of average everyday twist Damascus, ladder Damascus, it doesn't really do much for me uh, these days. Not like it used to. It used to really get me excited and you know i'd be oh, like i just couldn't wait to 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 forge some some damascus you know and 
But um, yeah, things things have changed as I've gotten older and as my skill set has has broadened, I guess you could say. Oh, there you go. And again, I see my come out right up in there. Nice, very nice. Again, I got it right down the center. It's slowly off to one side on the top, but it's pretty bang on all the way around. Yeehaw! Yeehaw! So Adam, if you're watching this uh, this one here, yes, you can use it. But uh, uh, the reason I made you two was so you can, you know, either put this on display somewhere for you know, or, or uh, you know, just keep it as a, as a keepsake in a box somewhere, whatever you want to do. Uh, the other one I made for your day to day, if you decide to uh, to use it for you know when you're kit bashing and stuff like that. Um, the other one is uh, is more along the lines of a of a traditional <coughs> kirudashi. Um, the um, just the overall being slightly tapered, rectangular. That's that's what a kirudashi uh, generally looks like. Uh, this one is still along the lines of of a, a traditional kirudashi, but slightly more stylized. And, um, wow, well, that pattern, uh, it came up pretty good. It came up pretty good. Now, what I do is I just wipe these down and get a small bit of 1200. And I just like to... Just rub down the uh, rub down the surface, just to ensure. You know, you may have picked up that in some spots there's like a, a very dark part of the pattern, and then there's a lighter part. Uh, I get kind of paranoid, so I just like to uh, sand them down just just a little bit, just to make sure that there's nothing laying on the surface that shouldn't be there. See how this is dark here, but where I etched, um, I had tape over there, so I, I get a little worried that perhaps there's some tape residue or, or something that shouldn't be there. So let's just give it a really light sand. And as much as I'm being a, what looks like I'm haphazard with, with this ferric chloride, please, everybody, face shields, glasses, the, the whole nine, okay? This stuff will send you blind if it gets in your eyes, okay? You also don't want it on your skin. It will burn you. I mean, it's not gonna burn you straight away. It's not like a nitric acid or anything, but it will, uh, it will burn your skin if you uh, give it the chance. So just, just be careful, guys, okay? All right. I need some new ferric chloride. I've had this stuff for a couple of years now, so I think it's starting to lose its potency. It, um... So after this very, very mild etch, uh, I'm going to blacking, uh, blacken it. 